Well, today we're in Psalms 124 through 128. Let's begin reading together here in Psalm 124, and I'll read the psalm to you. It only has eight verses, and we'll look at that together and then move on into Psalm 125 until we conclude this evening at Psalm 128. So, beginning at Psalm 124, verse 1, the writer says, uh, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us alive when their wrath was kindled against us. Then the waters would have overwhelmed us. The stream would have gone over our soul. Then the swollen waters would have gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. Our soul has escaped as a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And so as we continue exploring the Psalms, the Psalms that we're looking at right now, as I mentioned to you last time we were together, are called the Psalms of Ascent. This particular Psalm that we're looking at, Psalm 124, is a Psalm that focuses on God's deliverance. And the point that David is making here in Psalm 124 is he's saying to them basically this, because God has protected and delivered us in the past, then we as a nation ought to be thankful to Him. And that's the point he's making, and that's why as we read verses 1 and 2, that's why he said, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us alive when their wrath was kindled against us. Now, as he's reminding the nation of Israel of their history, he's actually doing that so that they can, they can remember the many ways that God has been there for them. All through their history, he has presented himself as being their sword, their deliverer, their shield. He's been their defense against their enemies in every way, especially as the enemies had desired to destroy them. Through the Old Testament, there are many promises that God gave to the nation of Israel that He would be with them and fight for them. For example, in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 1, verse 30, the Lord your God who goes before you, He will fight for you according to all He did for you in Egypt before your eyes. Or in the Old Testament book of Isaiah 43, verses 1 and 2, but now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and He who formed you, O Israel, fear not. For I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. To Jeremiah, he said in chapter 1, verse 19, they will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you. In the New Testament, the, the question is asked in Romans 8, 31, if, if, if God is, is for us, then, then who can be against us? And you see that promise over and over again. And so David is calling the nation of Israel to remember the way that God has in the past been faithful to deliver them, and they need to remember that. He says in verse 3, they, they would have swallowed us alive when their wrath was kindled against us. The waters would have overwhelmed us. The stream would have gone over our soul then the swollen waters would have gone over our soul. If God, in other words, were not for us, then the enemies would have destroyed them. They hated them. Their enemies hated them and wanted to destroy them. They would have swallowed us alive. They would have flooded over us as any enemy would do. So it's a picture of being completely destroyed. It reminds me especially of uh, when he states concerning the waters overwhelming us. It reminds me of the picture of a tsunami, how they would have overwhelmed us and utterly wiped us out. If God, he says had not been for us. But God is for us, and because God is for us, and he says, let Israel say that the Lord is on our side, because God is on our side, we have been protected by him. Verse 6 goes on to say, blessed be the Lord, who has not given us as prey to their teeth. Our soul has escaped as a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken. We have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. So he praises the Lord. He says, God has protected us against our enemies. God has not only worked in the past, as I cause you to recall those things that we, that we celebrate in our history, but God is able to work in our present also. 
In other words, the Bible is not filled with stories just to stir our imagination. But the Word of God is intended to communicate to us the God who is, is able to save in the past is able to deliver now. And that's the point that he's making. He's, he's saying you need to remember the exploits of God, the promises of God, how that God has stated, I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be there through all that you go through. So we don't remember the Scriptures simply because it's, it's something that we like, a, a book of history that we record in our memory as certain facts. But we look at the Word of God because God is alive, and God continues to move on our behalf even today. The Bible tells us in Psalm 46, verse 1, that God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in our time of trouble. And the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So what happened in the past is to illustrate God's ability to deliver in the present. And the psalmist here in Psalm 124, David, is saying, remember, God is on our side. He has been in the past. He is now. He will always be because he is the God who cares. He is the God who has made heaven and has made earth. Psalm 125, those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forever. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous reach out their hands to iniquity. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good and to those who are upright in their hearts. As for such as turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord shall lead them away with the workers of iniquity. Peace be upon Israel." And so when he speaks here in verses 1 and 2, he's basically pointing out that genuine faith in the Lord will provide an unshakable confidence. Notice how he says in verse 1, those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. And so he's saying trusting in the Lord provides an unshakable confidence. It gives you strength. As they're there looking around and seeing the mountains that surround Jerusalem, it's a picture of God encompassing them. It's a picture of them realizing that God has surrounded them. The Lord is caring for them. It's just a picture of them reminding, being reminded how, how God is, 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 uh, is there for them. It's, it's like what he says in Psalm 34, verse 7, where it says, the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. So God is there with you. It's once again a word of encouragement. It's a word of reminder. There are times when we go through our lives that we may not feel that God is with us, in other words. And he's saying, look, as you are coming into the city of Jerusalem, and remember that the psalms that we're looking at right now are psalms that were recited as they were entering in to celebrate various festivals and all, and as they came in, they'd be reciting psalms like this, and as they're there in the city, they'd be looking around and seeing the hills that surround uh, the, the city of Jerusalem, and in doing so, they're, they're, they're going through this particular scripture here, and, 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 there's, and the Lord is saying to them, listen, you can trust in me. I'm, I'm encompassing you, I am with you, and I'm taking care of you. Those words are intended for us as believers to have a faith in God. Paul in 2 Timothy in chapter 1 verse 12 said it this way. He said, for this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. One of the phrases I like in 2 Timothy 1.12 is when Paul says, I know whom I have believed. He didn't say, I know what I have believed, though it's important, of course, for us to know what we believe. I remember a young believer in our church many years ago approaching me, and he said to me something like this. He said, Pastor, I was asked a question about such and so, and I was just wondering what we believe. And I smiled at him, and I said, I know what I believe but it's very important for you to discover what you believe because it's not my responsibility to believe for somebody else. I don't have that capacity nor that desire nor that responsibility. My responsibility is to do the best that I can as a pastor teacher to, to um, explain the Word of God. But it's, it's your responsibility to, to hold fast to the things that are true and to make sure that those become your beliefs, not the beliefs 
that somebody else has conveniently thought through for you. And so I find it very important when Paul says, I know whom I have believed, that's different than saying, I know what I have believed. Now, obviously, Paul knows what he believes, but I think it's very important for us to realize that eternal life isn't just embracing a set of propositions. Eternal life is having a knowledge of God. Jesus said, this is eternal life in John 17, 3. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is eternal life. He didn't say this is eternal life in terms of length of days. He said this is eternal life in terms of quality of life and relationship. This is eternal life that they may know you. And so what we are supposed to do is not just adhere to a set of propositions or moral codes or things of that nature, which are part of the way that we live, obviously, because you read the Scripture and it explains to you how God wants you to live and, and you hold fast to those things. But it goes deeper than that. It goes into relationship. It goes into fellowship. It goes into knowledge of God loving you. You see, when you read this Scripture here and it says those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, He's speaking of a personal relationship that you have. Those who don't trust in the Lord aren't going to be like, like Mount Zion. Those who don't trust in the Lord aren't going to have a sense of God encompassing them and protecting them. Those who do trust in the Lord are going to be like Mount Zion in the sense that, that they're going to go through things, but they're going to be confident in the Lord. They're going to be unshakable in their faith, and they're going to know beyond a shadow of doubt that God is there with them no matter what, not because they're trying really hard to believe but because they're abiding in Him. And when you abide in the Lord Jesus Christ, when you're abiding in the true vine, you're going to produce fruit. And part of the fruit that is, is going to be produced is going to simply be a, a demonstration of your relationship with Him, that you indeed are abiding, because when you abide in the vine, then fruit is going to be produced. Part of that fruit is going to be the confidence of knowing that God is for you. Now, when he says in verse 3, the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous reach out their hands to iniquity, Israel had a history of invading nations, occupying them. You can read through the Old Testament, and you'll see that over and over again. They were overrun, and secular history points that out even to this day. They have had times and seasons where foreign nations have occupied them. And so that's going to continue off and on until Messiah comes and rules. When Jesus rules and reigns, that's when it ceases. But the point he's making is God has given you the land. And you have been intended by God to possess it forever. Therefore, evil will not prevail. Now, one of the reasons why evil will not prevail is because, and I want you to see this, how he puts it in verse 3. He says, lest the righteous reach out their hands to iniquity, evil will not prevail because as the presence of evil is there, it's going to tempt righteous people to fall away. So he's saying evil will not, it will not uh, be allowed to remain. Verse 4 is interesting how he says, Do good, O Lord, to those who are good and to those who are upright in their hearts. Now, it's interesting because he contrasts that with verse 5. I'll, I'll read verse 5, and I'm going to show you something. As for such as turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord shall lead them away with the workers of iniquity. And so he's contrasting, and this is something very practical for us. He's contrasting the fact that uh, those who are upright in heart, those who have a relationship with the Lord, with the Lord are the ones who are going to do good. And therefore, he says, those who have that relationship, God, bless them. Bless them. Bless those who love you, Lord. Bless those who live a righteous life. Bless those who understand that, that part of being a believer, uh, a very large part, is, is establishing an evidence that indeed you do have a relationship with God. See, there are a lot of people I encounter, and I've been a Christian for a while now, and over the years I've encountered quite a number of people who, who profess a faith in God and profess a faith in Jesus Christ. But as I've gotten to know them, and, and, and in some cases I worked with them long before I was pastoring in a church, I, I was working secular jobs, and, and I would spend time with people on the job and all, and, and, and many times uh, after months of working with them, uh, they would say something to me like, well, I'm a Christian. I remember one guy in particular. I used to share with this guy on the job, and uh, off, I, I did it quite often because he'd come into the office that I was working in, and, 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 and when he came in, he'd ask me things, and, and I began to share with him. And over the weeks and then into the months, he, he finally came in one day, and he says, David, he goes, uh, you keep talking to me uh, and telling me about the Lord. 
I said, yes. And he said, uh, didn't you know that I am a born-again Christian? And, and I'm looking at him, and the answer was no. No, I didn't know that he was a born-again Christian. And he says, well, he said, and I'm a born-again Christian. He said, and, and um, you know, you don't need to be witnessing to me all the time. I gave my heart to the Lord. He was watching some program on TV, and he prayed the prayer and all. But his life had never been captivated by Jesus. He, he didn't go to church. He didn't fellowship. He still was speaking in a way that he ought not to and doing things he really shouldn't have. And, and the, the way that he lived caused me to know or to believe, at least, that he wasn't saved. I've seen that many times, many times, where I've spoken to people, and, and they'll say, you keep treating. I remember a young lady in college. I'd been sharing with her in class. Uh, I was going to a secular college, and I would share with her in class. After class, I'd, I'd speak to her about the Lord. And after weeks of doing that, she finally said, you keep treating me like I'm not a Christian. Don't you know that I am a Christian? Well, if there's no fruit there, no evidence, how would I know? How would I know there's no fruit there? Listen, when you abide in Jesus Christ, you produce fruit. There's evidence. There's the Spirit in your life. There's an evidence that you know Him. It's going to be evident. Now, if you have people witnessing to you, so He says, do good, O Lord, to those who are good and to those who are upright in their hearts. In Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 25, the Bible says, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Psalm 119, verse 2 says, blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with a whole heart. And so do good to those who are good and to those who are upright in their hearts. But, verse 5, as for such as turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord shall lead them away with the workers of iniquity. Now, when, notice in verse 5 when it says, as for such as turn aside. When he says such as turn aside, that speaks of people who voluntarily desert the Lord, who decide voluntarily that it's not worth being a believer and they turn away. All through the Bible, both old and new, you have warnings against that. In uh, the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 11, verse 16, we read, take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Jesus in Matthew 6, 24 said it this way, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and earthly riches. You have to make a decision which kingdom you're going to pursue. That's why Joshua could be speaking to the children of Israel there in the Old Testament book of Joshua. And that's why Joshua, the man who was second in command under Moses, who we like to refer to as an under-shepherd or perhaps even what would be called today in a picture like a, an assisting pastor. And Joshua is there with, with Moses and he sees the works that God does and he's his right-hand man and ultimately Moses is removed from the scene and Joshua is elevated. And then Joshua ultimately brings the children of Israel to the point of entering into the land of promise and that's when he speaks to them and he says, you need to make a decision. You need to choose which gods you're going to serve. You can serve the gods from where we've come from, the gods over, over the river, or you can serve the God of heaven and earth who has delivered you. And then he goes on to say, choose you this day whom you shall serve. And then he says, as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. We have made a decision to pursue God with all of our heart. Not just me, Joshua, but my family. We're going to pursue the Lord with all of our heart. And so we make our decisions. Now, if we turn away voluntarily from the Lord, he's saying in verse 5, as, as for such as turn aside to their crooked ways, uh, the Lord shall lead them away with the workers of iniquity. And then he goes on to say, Peace be upon Israel. Psalm 126. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. Our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. 
He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. This is one of those psalms that, that gives to them a sense of celebration. Its context would be that it would be reminiscent of the time that the nation of Israel had been in captivity, especially when they were taken into the mighty nation of Babylon. And, and those of you who have been reading your Old Testament know that through a series of, uh, of uh, invasions, Babylon had entered into the nation of Israel and had taken the southern tribes captive. Now, there were 12 tribes of Israel. You have what are called the 10 northern tribes, and you had the two southern tribes. The 10 northern tribes didn't have a king who sat on the throne who was righteous. And in the mid-700s before Christ, the king of Assyria came and basically took those tribes and scattered them and took them captive. He also brought in some peoples from various lands and repopulated that particular section of, of, of Israel. But the two southern tribes had occasional righteous kings, and they continued on, and the Lord continued blessing them for over 100 years. But in 605 B.C., King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon invaded and through two more invasions, 597 and 586, pillaged the nation of Israel and took the people out and in doing so, basically undermined all the strength of the nation. The nation went into captivity and they were in captivity for some 70 years. When you read the book of Daniel and you look at chapter 9, Daniel is reading through the, the book of Jeremiah and he discovers that God had made the, the statement that he would judge them but also gave the promise that he would return them to the nation of Israel. And ultimately that took place starting in 536. In 536, Ezra led a, a contingency of, of, uh, of Jews back, and then later on through Nehemiah, others returned. And so this is one of those psalms that is, is reminiscent of the Babylonian captivity, but it also gives to us insight into the joy that they have when they enter into the city there to celebrate the reality of God being good to them. You see, in their time of, of Babylonian captivity, it was a time of great sorrow. The nation had been taken, and, and it was painful for those, especially those who loved the Lord. Later on, when we get to Psalm 137, verses 1 through 4, that actually speaks of that time. And listen, listen to what the psalmist says. He says, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yes, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there those who carried us away captive asked us a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song? in a foreign land. When we'd been taken captive, because the Jewish music is, is, is very festive, and, and if you ever hear Jewish music, and some of you have, it's got a real festive feel to it. Much of it is, is filled with celebration and all. Well, the Babylonians said, listen, you Jews have good music. We'd like to hear some of your songs. They said, we put our harps on the willow tree. How can we sing the Lord's song when we're in captivity? And so when they were finally released, well, that's what he says in verse 1, when the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. It was too good to be true. We're finally able to return. Our mouth was filled with laughter, our tongue with singing. And then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. And then he says, the Lord has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. We have, we've become open on our faith. As a matter of fact, it, they said among the nations, it actually became uh, common for them to say, look at what has happened. The Jews have returned. And then they're saying, yes, the Lord has done great things whereof we are glad. By the way, that is really the heart of all witnessing when you understand that God has done great things for you. Those who don't witness are generally those who haven't really recognized or realized what a great thing it is to be saved. Those who, those who don't share their faith uh, probably don't meditate on it very often, probably aren't really, really aware of what a wonderful thing it is that God has actually saved you. And, and when you know that, when that becomes a reality in your life, when you, when you know, you know what, I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I was deaf, but now I can hear. I was dead, but now I'm alive. I was without purpose, and now I have a, a reality of life. I, I have a reason to live. I'm going to go to heaven. When you finally get that realization in you, it's easy to talk about the Lord. It's easy to talk about the one you're in love with, by the way. 
It's easy to talk about the Lord if you love him. It's not that difficult. Listen, I've been around too many people who are in love with a young lady or a young guy, and, and they, they just can't get that guy's, you know, name off their lips. That gal's got to talk about that boy all the time to the point that it drives you nuts. You know, shut up. You know, I don't want to hear it. You know what? When you're in love with somebody, though, you do mention them. And you know what? It's an unselfconscious thing. I've been told that I mention Marie almost every time I speak. But I don't realize that. It, it, I don't have that in my notes at this point. Talk about Marie. You know, it's not there. It's just out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Am I right? What's in your heart is going to come out. So you go to the, to the, you go to the, um, to the mall and you find something that you like and you start telling your friends about it. Look, you ought to see what I got. Look at this. This is cool. This is so nice. Uh, you buy a new car. What did you do when you got that new car? Did you put it in the garage? Lock it up? Don't want anybody to see it? And after a while, you kind of go in there, turn on the light at midnight and look at it and close up the door. No, oh, man, you drove that pile of junk to see your friends in it. That's what you did. My, one of my first cars, not the very first car, uh, first car I had was a 55 Chevy. I wish I had it now. But I had a 57 Volvo. And some of you would have no clue what a 57 Volvo looks like. That's how memorable that model was. But I had a 57 Volvo. It was a, a car that was put together by a friend of mine who actually used it for parts. And, and then he, you know, he fixed up his other car and then sold it to me for something like 35 bucks. I forget how much it was. It wasn't worth that much. It had, a, it had different colored fenders and hood, and it blew smoke. It didn't, have, it didn't have two seats in the front. It had just the driver's seat, and then the seat, well, there was no seat next to it. And so what I did is my sister Madeline had, uh, she was a little, you know, at one time she had been a little girl, and she still had one of those little tea sets that the little kids play with, you know, the little tables and the little chairs. Uh, and I took one of those chairs, and I put it there as the, as the passenger seat, you know, and, 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 and I can still remember driving my mom in it, and it was a three-speed, and on purpose, I would shift a little hard so that the seat would fly backwards, and my mom would fall into the back seat, you know, and then I'd pick her up. You remember, my mom's here. You remember that, don't you, mom? Forgive me, okay? I'm sorry, but it was fun, and I would knock my mom back, and then she'd come back up, and it was a blast. It was the ugliest car you've ever seen. It was the ugliest car, but it was mine, and when I got it, I climbed in that car, and I drove it to my friend's house, and he said, let's take a ride. And they'd say, no way, that's a piece of junk. I said, ah, oh, it's a great car, let's go. Blowing smoke. I mean, you knew where I was any time of the day. And it was just an ugly piece of junk car. Now, if I'm willing to go out and talk about those things and show those things, why did I do that? Well, I did that because I liked it, because it was what I, I valued, right? I discovered that when I got saved, that it's easy to talk about the Lord because I like Him, because I love Him. It's easy to do that. All you need to do is fall in love with Jesus Christ. That's all you need to do. Somebody's saying, well, give me, you know, give me a series of scriptures that I can use and give me some real smart answers so when they ask the questions. I've discovered that when you're in love with the Lord, you're in His Word. And when you're in His Word, His Word gets into your heart. And when his word is in your heart, it's going to come out because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth is going to speak. And so that's, it's really that simple and all. And so that's what he's saying in verse 3. The Lord has done great things for us whereof we're glad and we're willing to talk about it. He goes on in verse 4 and says, Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Well, some have returned, in other words, but we need to bring them all back. And, and please bring back those who are dry and those who are spiritually thirsty. Bring them home too. Now, verses 5 and 6, beautiful verses. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Well, basically, the context is the land. The land had been pretty much barren and had been neglected for many years. You see, they've been in captivity, and so the farmers haven't been able to work on their, on their farmland. And so much of it is now pretty fallow, and, and it's got weeds or it's dried out. It just haven't, haven't, hasn't been cared for. It's been neglected. And so planting's going to be difficult. The point he's making, though, is though it may be difficult to plant, yet hard work will pay off in the end. When he speaks about crying, 
In verse 6, he who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Uh, I believe that that simply is a way of picturing the labor and how difficult it can be, but also it has a spiritual application. And let me give you that application as quick as, quick as I can. Tearful labor over a barren land produces a great harvest. There are people that are in a dry and thirsty place. They're called unsaved. You have the good news in the gospel that gives to the thirsty person a spiritual drink. Jesus said that, that the Holy Spirit was like water, living water, that would gush out of you. Jesus promised a woman at a well in Samaria that if she were to drink of that water of that well, well, that she's going to thirst again. But he said, but if you drink of the water that I shall give you, you shall never thirst again. In spiritual labor, and this is, this, by the way, these two verses I memorized uh, about 30 years ago or, or longer now in one of my doctrines classes. And our professor pointed something out that I've never forgotten. And I'll say it this way. If you want to see effect in your service to God, and I'm assuming that every person who came here tonight, I mean, you had to come through the rain, and, and many of you worked all day, and, and you still came on a Wednesday night. I'm assuming that, that you have a hunger for Jesus Christ. You wouldn't do that for any other reason. And so let me give to you something that will help you in your, in your service to God. And I've said it in a variety of ways, but let me say it this way because it's most effective this way. I really believe that you become effective when you learn to cry for those who are unsaved. I really believe that God honors your tears. I really do. When you begin to honestly look at your grandmother or your grandfather, or you begin to look at your mom or you look at your dad, you look at a husband or you look at your wife, you look at your kids or you look at your brother or your sister, when you begin to look at your co-workers and realize that, yeah, they can be mean, and yes, they can gossip, and yes, they can be very terrible to work with and work for. There's no doubt about it. Sometimes they're very difficult to work with. But when you begin to realize that the reason they're that way is because they have no hope in this world and no hope for the next one, when you begin to realize that they're lost and that they do only what is natural to them, and when you begin to realize that if you're living for Jesus Christ on the job, well, you're a light. You're a living light in a very dark place. And, and one of the things Jesus taught us is that light has a way of exposing darkness. People don't come to Christ because they enjoy the darkness. Now, you, know, you might disagree with that. Somebody here might say, I don't believe that. I think that people don't enjoy having miserable lives. No, you enjoy what you're used to. You enjoy what you've gotten used to, and you begin to explain why it's okay to have that. And when people are in darkness, they get used to the darkness. They begin to think that darkness really is light. But here you come onto the job site, and you've got a, a, a happy spirit, a joyful spirit about you. You start sharing some things. You don't go through the things that they're going through and all because, man, you got saved, and, and you were pulled out of that a long time ago, and they can sometimes resent you. They might even gossip about you, and then you go home, and you're hurt, and you're thinking, when are they going to get it? How come they don't understand? Well, they can't understand because they're walking in spiritual darkness. They can't understand because the life that they have is the only one they think they're ever going to have. And so what do you do? Well, instead of getting mad and saying, you know what, I thought this was a job God was going to give to me so I could be used by him, but obviously, you know, I'm not being used. I want to get out of here. Instead of doing that, maybe you need to get on your knees, and I don't know if you can or cannot do something like this, but maybe you can get down on your knees and you can say, God, give me a heart that's broken for those who are lost. God, help me. God, help me to feel the feeling of their infirmity. And God, help me not to forget where I came from. God, help me to remember that I'm no different than they are except by your grace and your goodness. 
And let me tell you something, and this isn't a popular thought. As a matter of fact, I can be honest with you. I was teaching at a pastor's conference many years ago, and, and as I was sharing at a pastor's, a Calvary sectional pastor's conference, as I was sharing at a certain point, I was sharing how the Apostle Paul said to the Ephesian elders that I was amongst you in tears. I shared with tears. You know what manner of life I've always lived amongst you. And he begins to speak concerning the humility and the way that he served. And he said, and I served amongst you with tears. And when I shared that, my heart was pierced. And I welled up with tears. And I said, you need to have a heart that's broken with the things that breaks the Lord Jesus' heart if you expect to be used by God. And later on, some of the pastors were upset, wondering, why does David cry? He doesn't have to cry. These are pastors. These are pastors who don't understand that until you put yourself in the place of somebody who's lost, until you feel their pain, until you understand their sorrow, then you're going to have a self-righteous attitude and you're never going to reach them. But if you remain close to where you came in, not that you want to go back, but just never forgetting then even though I've been a Christian for a while now, I haven't forgotten. I haven't forgotten what it's like to be a drunk. I haven't forgotten what it's like to have nobody that I felt really loved me. I haven't forgotten what it's like to wake up in somebody's backyard drunk and not know how I got there. I haven't forgotten so much of what I went through and what I did to myself for so long. And that's why I can talk to people and they'll tell me where their hearts are and they know they're not getting judged by me because I understand that, but I also know the solution. And it's Jesus Christ who transforms lives. And if he transformed mine, he can transform yours too because he doesn't love me any more than he loves you. And he's not, he didn't get a prize when he got me, and everybody says amen, and that's true. <laughs> he didn't get a prize when he got me. He just got somebody he loves, and he got you too. And if you can go forth weeping, bearing precious seed, you shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing your sheaves with you. There will be fruit in your labor because you have the heart of Christ who looked at the city of Jerusalem and wept because they didn't know their day of visitation. The heart of Jesus who stood by a tomb where a dear friend named Lazarus had died and was buried. And the scripture, the smallest scripture I know of, just simply says, shortest verse just says, Jesus wept. Behold was the response, how he loved him. Why are you weeping, Jesus? Jesus, you're going to raise him from the dead, and you know that. In a moment, you're going to say, remove the stone. And then you're going to have to argue with them because they're going to say, well, Lord, he's been in there for four days, and, and he stinks by now. Remove the stone. You know that you're going to do a work and yet you're weeping. Why are you doing that? Because of what sin does to people. Because the wages of sin is death. That's why. And Jesus came to roll away the stone from our hearts and our lives that we might have his life. And when we understand that, and when we begin to say, Lord, I'm willing to be touched with the feelings of others' infirmities, if that means that I'll have a ministry of compassion, then God will bless you. But if we have this aloof kind of mentality where how can they do that and why don't they learn, we'll never be used really by the Lord because we're no longer their helpers, we become their judges. And at that point, we have no ministry. We need to be soft in these things, guys, because, you know, even as I'm watching young people, I'm growing to realize I am older. I'm growing to realize that, and I can generally tell that by a variety of things, including what I think is acceptable in ways of dress, what I think is acceptable in ways of music. And when I hear the boom, 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 you know, I go, oh, man, that gives me a headache. And, and I forget that I used to play Led Zeppelin at the top, you know, and my dad would walk in and say, that gives me a headache, you know. And I, I look at some kid with spiked hair and piercings all over that, that have to cause pain, and I look at that person, and then I remember my dad, when are you going to get your hair cut? 
And, and, and it keeps me going. It keeps me remembering, you know what? No different than me, looking for some answers in life, trying to be themselves. What they need is Jesus Christ. Just love them for Christ's sake and cry for them. You see, this hippie movement that, that I was part of and this Calvary Chapel ministry that I'm, I'm grateful to be part of, it began because Kay Smith, Chuck Smith's wife, Kay and Chuck used to you sit on Main Street there by the pier in Huntington Beach, and, and Chuck would fold his arms, and he'd look at these hippies walking by, and he'd, and he'd say, they're disgusting, and, and, and look at them, get a job, and cut your hair, and put on some shoes, and, he, and then Kay would cry. She would cry and she'd pray for him. And Chuck would sit there looking at these, these kids that he thought were just the worst kids you could possibly be, looking at them. He might have seen me more than once, you know, walking by. What a scummy-looking guy that is. You know, and, and he didn't like us. He didn't like us. But Kay saw lost children. And Kay prayed, and Kay wept, and God honored that and touched Pastor Chuck Smith's heart so that he finally said, you know what? Let's win these children to Christ. And some of the Calvary Chapel pastors that you know of, well-known guys like Greg Laurie and Mike McIntosh and others like that, the Steve Mazes, were hippie kids who were into the drugs and into everything that were ambushed by the love of God and through the tearful prayers of Kay Smith and eventually Pastor Chuck Smith so that kids like me were not kicked out of churches when I came walking in barefooted with long hair, loaded, and having been drinking. And I was not kicked out of Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. I was welcomed. And I sat amongst people like, like that, and I was ambushed by the Spirit of God. And it didn't have to be called Calvary Chapel. It could have been called any other name, Emmanuel Christian Fellowship. didn't matter. The name did not matter. The Spirit was there. And Jesus was there. And that comes because people pray and say, God, save them. That's how it works. Moving on, Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Well, as you look at this, you have a couple of applications. Obviously, one, um, it may simply speak about the reality of construction and protection. And so you can see in verses 1 and 2 when he says, unless the Lord builds the house, the labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It's vain for you to rise up early, sit up late to eat the bread of sorrows, for he gives his beloved sleep. And so what you see here is you see a very basic thing. Without God's grace towards us, those things trying to build and trying to protect and trying to eat, all those things are pointless. They're done in vain. It also, though, has an application uh, about building a family because a house in the city can represent home and it can represent children. So it requires God's assistance and protection to successfully raise a family. Verse 2 seems to point that out. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for he gives his beloved sleep. What, re what we are requiring is complete dependence on God. Listen, if you want to raise your kids right, then it requires complete dependence on God. It requires for us to understand that, that if we pursue things, and we can pursue things, I mean, we can pursue whatever it is that we eat or whatever it is that we want to drink, we can pursue those things, but in doing so, uh, we're going to ultimately lose our children. What we really need to do is we really need to value them. And so, I need to be somebody who is fully aware of the desire of my heart to, to build a family. And unless the Lord is building that house, in other words, unless I'm depending on Him, then my labor is not going to be anything that is fruitful or successful. When he says in verse 3, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb is His reward, Children born in a godly family are a blessing in that they receive the faith and pass that faith on to other people. You see, a Jewish man wanted not just a son, he wanted many sons. 
But not only did he want sons, the Jewish man wanted godly sons. He wanted sons that could take the faith of Israel and, and give it to, to uh, his own children, which would be the man's grandchildren. When he speaks concerning having a, a quiver full of children in verse 5, it's simply speaking about a house full of children. And a house full of children can be a protection in a variety of ways. We live in a society, we live in a time when some people don't seem to understand the value of children from, from, a, from a fellowship kind of aspect. I have, I have seen, and I have to be careful not to go too long on this particular subject, but I have seen some who don't value their children. They really don't. I have, I have met women who have had children not because they want to have children so much as perhaps to prove that they can have children. I, I don't understand it. And sometimes children are being born to, to young ladies uh, because the young lady is lonely and, and wants to have a child almost as if she needs a toy or something that won't leave her, and I've seen that. And I've also seen that in some, in some uh, circumstances, uh, I have heard the young ladies who have said, uh, my boyfriend, because they're living in, gang, in a gang kind of situation, my boyfriend may not survive, and I want to have someone to remember him by, and they have children by their boyfriend because they're expecting their kid, their boyfriend, to one day be killed on the street. I mean, that's true. Some of you may not believe that, but some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, and you know it's, it is true. That's what happens in some places. And those are actual conversations and things that I am aware of, you see. You know, my boyfriend may not make it back. I want to have a child with him, so I will always have a part of him in my life because he may not make it back. He may not live, living on the streets that we live on. And that's the truth. That's what happens. But in a way, what it is, it's, it's, it's looking at children as, in a way that God doesn't, doesn't uh, give to us any, any indication that that's good. He says, listen, children are a heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. And, and blessed is the man who has a, a quiver full of them because... Because they, one, they, they are a form of protection in some ways, remembering in the Jewish society that they really didn't have what we would call any kind of retirement benefits. There wasn't some kind of IRA or even a social security system of any sort. What you had is you had your children, and your children ultimately would care for you. So if you had many children, the children would work and produce income and take care of you. That's how it worked. That's how it was designed to work in the Jewish economy. So if I'm a man and I have my boys, my boys had a responsibility of caring for dad, and they would. And so blessed is the man who has a quiver full of them, meaning he's got a lot of sons because those sons will provide a lot of income for him so his old age will be comfortable. They're honoring their father by caring for him. Not only that, but there are going to be times when he needs someone to come to his defense. When you're a, a younger man, you pretty much take care of yourself or do the best that you can. As you grow older, you begin to realize that you're not as strong as you once were. It's nice to have some big sons around to take care of you. Sons who will stand up and say, no, this is my father, you respect him. When he speaks concerning their being at the, at the gate, in verse 5, uh, they shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. In other words, your sons will come to your defense. The gate is a place or a picture of where civil matters were discussed and resolved. And so they'll come alongside of you to speak a word of defense for you. And so children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. The Lord wants to give to us, in other words, godly children. And what a blessing it is when we do have godly children. Now, of course, an ungodly child is a broken, it produces a broken heart. But a godly child is a wonderful child to have. And finally, Psalm 128. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways, when you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house. Your children, like olive plants all around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you out of Zion, and may you see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Yes, may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. And so a faithful person finds prosperity as a result of their physical labor. That's what he says in uh, verse 2. He says, when you eat the labor of your hands. You see, the foundation of the relationship, the foundation of God's blessing in verse 1 is fearing the Lord and walking in His ways. 
And so if I want to have a life that is blessed, if I want to have a family that is blessed, it's going to be the result of me walking in the fear of God. The fear of the Lord provides an atmosphere in a, in a family of respect and provides an atmosphere of love. Proverbs 14, 26 says, In the fear of the Lord there's a strong confidence, and his children will have a place of refuge. Proverbs 22, verse 4 says, By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. So when you're walking with the Lord, you're obedient to Him, and in obedience, God blesses you. And that's the point He's making in verse 2 when He says, when you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy and shall be well with you. Now, in verses 3 and 4, He speaks of your wife and your children. Your wife's going to be like a fruitful vine, and your children are going to be like olive plants. In other words, it's a picture of a family gathered together. When you have your meals together, and you've got your wife there, and you've got your children at the table, and, uh, and it, it's, it sometimes can be stressful, you know, around Thanksgiving especially. But when you got them there together, I don't know, there's just something about that. There's just something about being with your family. It's an enjoyable thing. You know, a couple days ago we had the opportunity, and this goes along with, uh, with your verse 6, you may see your children's children. Um, just the other day, um, I forget what day it was, I think it was Monday, um, Marie, my wife, had uh, our grandson, Josiah. And so she, she, she loves to just take him all day long, and, and she just drives him everywhere. And, and then she brings him home, and she'll give me a call, and she'll say, guess who I have? And I'll say, Josiah? And she'll say, yep, I've got Josiah here, and he's saying, come home, Grandpa. And then she'll put Josiah on the phone, and Josiah thinks he's, he thinks he's talking now. And so he just jabbers a few things. You know, I don't understand a thing that he's saying, but it's just great. And as he does, it's kind of like listening to Rawl. It's, it's great. <laughs> I don't understand a word of it. But as he's speaking, you know, and then I hear the little voice, and I go home. So as I get home, you know, I, I'll come into the garage, and Marie will have him, and he's out there helping her do something or other. He's 20 months old now, and he'll be helping her do something, and, and uh, that's what he was doing. And so I walk in, and, and I'm holding him, and he gets very excited. He comes running into my arms, and I get to kiss him and hold him and carry him. Then I sit him down, and he wants to eat cookies, and, and we give him so much sugar, and his mom says, don't do that, man. He doesn't go to sleep. And I say, ha, 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 I know. Um, <laughs> You know, enjoy it, because that's what you did to us. And so I, you know, I'll sit him down, and I'll, and I'll just feed him. I give him whatever it is he wants, he's got. And I have to tell you, as I was sitting there just this last week, and I was feeding him his dinner and all, and he eats, and he smiles, and he, oh, it's just wonderful. I know what he's talking about when he says, may you see your children's children. As the Lord blesses you, as the Lord keeps you, what a joy it is to have your wife at the table. What a joy it is to have your kids around you. And what a joy it is when you've got your little grandson there. What a joy that is. And that is the true blessings of the Lord. Listen carefully because many people don't understand that. They think the true blessing is if they got a nice house, a nice car, a good job, and, and great vacations. That is not the true blessing of the Lord. You know, thank God for the prosperity, and I bless the Lord for the goodness that he shows to us as he does give to us those things to use but that doesn't fulfill us, and everybody knows that. If you've lived long enough, you know that. You know that. You get the promotion, you get the raise, you get all those things, and it doesn't satisfy your heart. It never will, because when you get a raise, all you want now is another raise. And once you've had that, you want another raise. That's just the way it is. You get the promotion, you want another promotion, because it never satisfies. If it did satisfy, you'd never want another raise. But it doesn't, does it? The car that you get that you wanted so badly that everybody's going to admire, after a while it goes out of, out of date. The new model comes out. What do you want? Well, you want to pay this one off as fast as you can so you can get the new one. Why? Well, because this is out of style. None of that stuff ever, ever works. But you want to know what does? It's, it's the truth, and you know this. Some of you know this very well. It's when your kid walks in the house, and I got my son Joseph, 23 years old. He's going to Bible college. And he comes home yesterday from Bible college for just for the, for the afternoon and evening. My 23-year-old son comes walking in. The first thing he does is walks up to Dad and puts his arms around me and kisses me right on the mouth and says, Dad, I love you. That's what matters. Not what he drove him to the parking lot to come and see Dad. But the boy who walked in put his arms around me and tells me, Dad, I love you. That matters. And when you walk in and you've got a little grandkid who sees you and his whole world erupts in joy because you're home, 
that matters. When you walk into a house and your wife is there faithfully doing whatever, whatever it is that she needs to do, and you walk into that house as a husband, you walk into that house, and the first thing your wife does is she sees you and she comes across the room and hugs you and gives you a kiss and says, I love you, that matters. Those are the things that matter. Not what I drove home, not the home that I walked into, not the clothes that I'm wearing, not how my hair looks. None of that matters. What matters is the essential things in life. And God gives you those things, and he blesses you. And there's nothing like being at a table with a family that's in love with the Lord and in love with each other because of him. Nothing like it. And that's what brings peace.